I have a class that's called Finding Elusive Records. We've chopped it up in, it's a series of use cases, about a dozen little use cases that demonstrate research techniques and use of the features on the website. And we've posted those little videos up on online. We're going to be updating it with snips from the sessions from this conference as well, because I've updated the slides from last year and added new scenarios. There's two main areas to what's online. The first has to do with unindexed images. A lot of people don't realize that 77% of the data and growing is not searchable or hintable. And mainly because it's just individual images, the systems don't know what's written on those images. So you kind of got to browse like a digital microphone. Uh, so there's a couple tips and tricks and techniques to use to dig into those. Using indices that are found in the images, um, accessing ancillary indices that were created in other books. These, they're not indexed, so they can't be searched. These are all in the image, but you can find these manually created uh, organization of the records inside the image set. Um, looking at the beginning of the image set to see if there's some guidance as to what image or page in the book certain things start and stop on. There's a whole lot of clues and even just looking at the thumbnails, you can tell where certain sections of the images start and stop, like in a probate, they, they have some blank images at the beginning of each probate. So it's, it's techniques like that for dealing with the unindexed images. People shouldn't be afraid of trying to get into those because you're really not going to be looking through 7 million images, right? You, you can dig in and, and slice and dice it. The second half of the presentation is about the more advanced search tools, and we run through a number of, of techniques and tools. A lot of people don't realize that our system uses wildcards. They can do exact searching. They can filter by collection. They have a bunch of other filters on there. And these tools allow you to cast a broad net, pull in a bunch of records, and then only deal with the records that you want to deal with. These tools allow you to bring back more records using wildcards and find things that are poorly indexed or don't have a lot of, of data on them and things like that. So. I guess what I would tell people is this. The first half is don't be afraid of those unindexed images. There's lots of ways to dive in. The second half is learn how to iterate on your search results. There's a lot of people who go to the family tree, they look at the person page, and down on the right-hand side there's a little search records, family search logo. And I find a lot of people are clicking that logo. The family tree sends some, some person data over to the search system and then the user lands on the search system, they just look at that and then walk away. And that system is intended for them to iterate, change the parameters, take out some names, close down the, the marriage data, change the place, expand the date range. Um, there's a lot of things they can do there to iterate on their search and find those records if they use all of the filters, tools that we give them. So it's really not intended just click go look at the search results, and if you don't see anything you like, leave. It's meant to iterate and, and dig. Well, uh, there's two wild cards. They come out of a Unix system, actually, and I don't want to get too geeky on you, but the computer systems often recognize the star character, asterisk, as a wild card, and the question mark. They function differently. The asterisks will match zero to an infinite number of characters. So if I go into my search string in the, in the first name field and I put a wildcard in there, wherever I put a wildcard, the system will substitute that star, for instance, with zero to an infinite number of ambiguous characters. If I type in, I use this in the Prezo, S-T-A-N, Stan, and I put a star after it, when I do that search, the system might bring back a record that has Stan on it, where it substituted the star for zero ambiguous characters. Or it might bring back Stanislaw, where it substituted the star for five ambiguous characters at the end of the name. That's a wild card. There's two of them. The, the question mark will replace one and only one ambiguous character. So Elizabeth with a Z or an S uh, will be brought back. require that the user has one unambiguous character. It's not very useful, but it's entirely possible to type M star and get back all of the names, for instance, that start with the letter M. 
There's another thing about it. You can use wild cards in the names or in the places. Dates are on our system on Family Search are always exact. If I tell the system I want records from the year 1800 to 1804, it is not going to bring back any records that have that event in 1799 or 1805. We, we honor exactly what the user said in terms of the year range on date and do not expand that. We figured if you wanted records from 1805, you could have told us that. <laughs>
but it, it has been it would originally was taught to speak tree to record it was taking tree data and finding historical records we've been teaching it to do tree to tree which is a little bit different algorithmically because tree data is a little different than record data it's a little richer and so we've taught it to speak tree to tree so that we could replace the old possible duplicate system in family tree with that engine and so oh in about a week after the conference we're intent is to start throwing a, we'll throw away that old system and transition all of our products onto the new possible duplicates based on the hinting engine users are the ui won't change but users are going to wake up one day and they're going to say whoa this possible duplicates feels better it'll we've proven through lots of labeling and, and analysis that it finds more real possible duplicates its ability to find the match the, the people that are really duplicates is better and it shows fewer false ones so we're going to be really happy with that once it gets uh, in, in the system we're also coming out with a new source linker shortly and that it'll have a cleaner neater look it, it makes it easier to find some of the features that have been hard for users to discover um, it's much faster the original source linker may have taken 12 seconds to load the new one on average it's about four seconds Oh, I'm sorry, the current one's about four, but the new one may even exceed that. So it'd be much snappier and easier to use. Those are a couple things that they'll see. You know, I've been telling everyone at this conference, there's a couple things that, that I've noticed users um, need to know. Since two-thirds of the data on our website, about 77% today, is not indexed, which means the search engines and the hinting system can't help you find those records, you have to dig into the unindexed image sets. Online, we will have the tutorials and techniques to how to do that, and so don't be afraid of doing that. You're, if you don't look at those unindexed image sets, you're missing out on three-quarters of the data that could be about your relatives. The second thing, like, and I, we may have already talked about that, is when you click that family search logo on the person page and it takes you from the family tree over to the search system, anticipate that you're supposed to use the refine your search form on the side and dig deeper. That's the whole point of that system is to iterate and dig. I think those are two key takeaways that people need to, to understand. It'll be under the finding elusive records because okay. we've taken that presentation and busted it into little use cases. So that's probably a good place to, okay. and I'll just keep building that out with more and more use cases and techniques as time goes by.